Okay. So, uh, thanks so much, Ruth, for uh, the warm words, uh, and it's wonderful to be here. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about joint work with Amajid Budi Raja from uh, University of North Carolina. Uh, and it's on convergence to obliquely reflected brown emotion in the quarter plane. It's a very uh, simple setting. If geometry is just that of the, sim of the quarter plane. And you may ask yourself, why am I bothering with you with such a simple setting, such a trivial problem? when there's so much uh, literature on converges to uh, diffusions, to reflected diffusions. Let me start by describing a random walk constrained to a polyhedral domain that looks like that. It is driven by uh, a rate n exponential clock. Whenever the clock rings, it makes a jump. Uh, and the way it jumps is that it first chooses uniformly at random a, directions in, a direction in which to jump, and then it makes a jump of size one over square root n. So this is diffusive scaling. Uh, and this is when it's here, here meaning uh, away from the boundary, but when it's close to the boundary, but still away from corners, uh, the resulting position could be like here, could be outside the domain. And then uh, the extra thing that happens is that it makes a, it gets projected down to the uh, back to the boundary along a specific along a direction that is specified. And there is one direction specified for each uh, for each face. And the direction simply sa uh, satisfies, uh, the condition that direction dot the inward normal is strictly positive, meaning it points inward. It makes sense to jump in that direction, to project in that direction. Then if uh, we are close to the corners, then uh, this uh, uh, question of uh, projecting may have different solutions depending on which face you're using. And then it have multiple solutions, but it could also have no solution. So in that case, you can do anything uh, reasonable that is uh, uh, stays local. So for concreteness, let's say that you jump, you make a jump uh, in a direction that's chosen uniformly at random in the, in the directions where you can, uh, uh, when you, remain in the domain. Uh, so a question is, uh, does the walk converge to reflected brown emotion in the closure of the domain D? Whereby a reflected brown emotion, we mean a continuous process that behaves like brown emotion in the, in the interior and reflects off the boundary in specified directions like this. And the time that it spends on the boundary has measure zero. Uh, but first we have to ask, to, to answer an even more basic question, whether, uh, namely whether uh, such a process even exists. Does reflected brown emotion even exist in this generality? And the answer is, well, no, not always. It depends on the geometry. So let's focus on the geometry of just a corner. Uh, and this question goes back to work by Veritan and Williams. Uh, so here's a corner, here is uh, uh, a wedge of angle psi, there are two faces, f1, f2, there are two directions here. Uh, and the angles are denoted by theta1 and theta2. Theta corresponds to, gives the angle with respect to uh, the inward normal. And it's considered positive uh, if uh, the direction tends towards the origin, negative other words, uh, otherwise. Uh, and what was found by Vardan and Williams was that this parameter alpha is of crucial importance to the problem. It dictates, it dictates various things. Uh, one of them is that reflected Brown motion exists if and only if alpha is strictly less than one, less than two. And so you may ask yourself, well, what happens if alpha is two or higher? Uh, then there's still a reflected Brown motion if you're willing to give up the third condition, which is that it stays, it's, it spends zero time on the boundary in the sense of Lebesgue measure zero set of times, uh, namely 
when it gets to the corner, if you allow it to stay there, yes, there exists such a process, but I will not call it a reflective Brownian motion. Uh, this way, this way. So when, in particular, when Xi is pi over two or, or higher, you notice that alpha is always, by definition, always between minus two and two, and therefore uh, the process always exists. So you can rephrase the question. You can ask whether in a, in a case where all angles are pi over two or higher, convergence holds. Because then at least the, the, the candidate limit process is well-defined. And if you see this, if you haven't seen this before, it may, there are two things that may surprise you. And uh, one is that there are cases where the problem is open, at least prior to this work was open, in particular, when alpha is between one and two. And the other thing that might surprise you is not about convergence, but about the, the very existence of reflected brown motion in higher dimension. Uh, in general, uh, the question is open. And for concreteness, uh, suppose we generalize, we, 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 we do the orthant in higher dimension instead of the quarter plane. The well-posedness of RBN is, is an open problem. When, when you're looking at the positive orthant with general direction of constraint on each face. So in fact, the, the convergence question, the convergence question is too early to, 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 to ask at this point when you don't even have a candidate for the limit. This is why we work in dimension two. Uh, so I'd like to start by uh, reviewing very briefly uh, the approaches that have been used to, for convergence to reflect the diffusions. And this is closely tied to questions of existence and uniqueness of RBM. Uh, and this is by no means going to be comprehensive. There is a vast literature on the subject. Then I'll describe the setting and the results. I'll apply it to queuing models and hopefully have some time for the proof outline and a couple of concluding remarks. Uh, so I'll start by the strong formulation, by which I mean a notion that uh, goes along, uh, follows the ideas of uh, strong solutions to stochastic differential equations. Uh, and this started with Skorohodin dimension one, Tanaka for convex Euclidean domains uh, Harrison and Ryman for uh, the orthant with a certain spectral radius condition, Leonce Slipman for general Euclidean domains with smooth boundary and uh, oblique reflection. Then uh, a paper by Dupuy and Ishii that studied a geometry, analyzed a geometric condition uh, that is sufficient for existence and uni uniqueness of strong formulation that I'll describe in a minute which extends, in a special case of the orthant, uh, the condition of Harrison and Ryman. And then uh, Dupuy and Ramanan convex, uh, studied, analyzed the convex, through convex duality, the condition by Dupuy and Ishii. And what is the approach? The approach is to consider first a deterministic problem of constraining a trajectory, how to constrain a trajectory. So suppose we're given D, a vector field, that defines those directions on the boundary, the final boundary of a domain D, uh, then we are given uh, a trajectory Psi, which is an unconstrained trajectory. It's just a continuous trajectory in RK, starting at in the closure of the domain. And then the problem is to find a pair where the first part uh, component of it is, is, is a constraint, the constrained version of psi, it's phi, and the second is const the, the constraining term. The first one is continuous and takes values in the closure of the domain cell. The other one, the second term is absolutely continuous, such that constrained is equal to the unconstrained data plus a constraining term. The constraining term has to satisfy this condition. What, what we can read from here is that it is active, it, 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 is, uh, it in, can increase only or change only when the constrained trajectory is on the boundary. Glorified score of order reflect. Huh? Glorified score of order reflect. Yeah. yeah. Or generalized. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and uh, 
the direction it, in which it uh, pushes when on the boundary is specified is, is d of that. So d is a specified vector field of directions. And indeed, if there exists a unique solution, then the solution map that I'll denote by gamma is called the score hold map. Uh, so how do you construct reflected Brownian motion? You just uh, feed the map by a Brownian motion. You get a reflected process and you call it a reflected Brownian motion. How do you construct strong solutions to, to stochastic differential equations? You consider um, uh, this system that looks like that. You have to assume something about the coefficients, of course. This generalizes to space of RCLL paths. Uh, and Kavita has uh, pushed this or has uh, extended this notion beyond the case of absolutely continuous trajectories, constraining trajectories. Uh, and the solution map she called the extended scorehood map. And there's recent work by Rich Bass and Chris uh, on, quest on questions of pathwise uniqueness, non uniqueness for RBM in the orthant. Uh, that is really uh, very recent. But now as for convergence, what do you, wh wh how does it help you with convergence? Well, most of these uh, papers have also provided conditions under which the map is, is continuous. So once you have continuity, you have convergence via the continuous mapping theorem. As for weak formulations, one starting point is the struck varadhan martingale problem. So uh, it's a way of defining a diffusion associated with an elliptic differential operator L, uh, where a solution is defined to be a probability measure on continuous paths under which this object, this expression, is always a martingale with respect to this, to this measure. And further, a further idea by Stuck and Verdun was to consider a very similar object or exactly the same object to define the sub martingale problem in order, in order to define, in order to uh, characterize and define diffusions with reflection constrained to, uh, uh, a smooth, to, to, to domains with smooth boundary. And so here, a solution is a probability measure, again, continuous, but now restricted to paths that are uh, take values in the closure of the domain, such that the, exactly the same object is now uh, a sub-martingale, provided that the test function increases in the, the direction of the constraint. So this is the direction of the specified by D. So this is the, uh, directional derivative in direction in direction D has to be non-negative on the boundary. And uh, 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 the intuition here is that um, if you look at this expression, then uh, there's a pushing, the, there may be a pushing uh, process on or constraining process that acts on the boundary that contributes uh, to an increase or to contribute by positive to positive increments of this object, um, because indeed, when it pushes inward, and and the uh, directional derivative is positive in that direction, this can only result with contribution that is non-negative to this expression. But of course, the point is that it's a clean formulation in the sense that it doesn't include uh, this pushing process, you don't, so that, that's why it's, uh, which is advantageous. You don't need to know that there exists such a process. As for the corner or for the wedge, uh, going back to Verdan and Williams, the sub martingale problem for binary motion in a wedge, uh, as I already said, uh, uh, was considered by them and uh, existence and uniqueness was proved to, uh, be equivalent to the condition alpha less than two. I didn't mention that the corner, they also proved that the corner is reached if and only if alpha is between zero and two. So alpha is again, 
an imp important uh, parameter also in this respect. And then a third respect is uh, Ruth has also proved that the process, the resulting process, RBM, is a semi-martingale if alpha is less than one, and it is not a semi-martingale if alpha is greater than one. Uh, Quan and Williams is an extension of the submartingale problem to a higher dimension, to high dimensional cone. And very recently, Lechner, Liu, and Reed uh, have extended uh, the Vardan Williams results to the case where you also have a constant drift. And this is uh, very relevant to this talk, as you will see. There are other weak formulation approaches. One is uh, for semi martingale reflecting reflected Brownian motions, uh, work by Ryman and Williams and Taylor, Taylor and Williams, uh, which define the process uh, along the same lines of defining uh, weak solutions to SDE. And Christina and Tom Kurtz have the constrained martingale approach. Uh, and I think we're going to hear about this from Christina in her talk. As for convergence, uh, so originally in, in the original paper by, by Struck and Verden, they already gave uh, criteria for convergence, general results on convergence via convergence of generators. Another tool is uh, uh, oscillation inequalities that I apply for semi-martingale reflective one emotion in polyhedral domains uh, by, by these authors. Uh, and I should also mention a third approach via Dirichlet forms uh, that applies for reversible processes, in particular where reflection is normal and uh, the state of the art is a paper by Chris and Chin Chin uh, that studies convergence of walks or discrete processes to RBM in a very, very non-smooth setting. So, but as I said, I'm talking today about a very, very simple setting, very simple geometry, just the quarter plane. And so let's ask ourselves, what tools do we have for proving convergence in the existing literature? One is continuous mapping approaches. So uh, it turns out that it only covers cases in which alpha is between minus one and one, not beyond that, but also only a strict subset of that because there are counter examples as well. And another tool that I mentioned is oscillation inequalities, but as I said, it covers the semi-martingale case. And as we also, I also mentioned uh, semi-martingale is val the process is semi martingale when alpha is less than one. So we are left with this regime where uh, there are no earlier tools for that. And this is our goal. So let me describe the setting. Here's a, uh, some notation. EI are standard basis, the standard basis vectors. Uh, I dash is three minus I. So if I points to one face, I dash is the other one. The quarter plane is script, script S and D is the space of RCLL path with the J1 topology. And here in this picture, uh, we see our setting. This is the family of Markov processes that we're looking at, that we, we're going to study. Uh, they have different behavior in the interior on the boundaries and at the origin. And the first thing to notice is the scale here. The scale is one over square root N, which means that the jump sizes here are of size one over square root N, but the rates are as before N, order N. So for example, lambda one N is linear in N, and then there's a correction term of square, square root N. Another thing to notice is that lambda, lambda I and mu I, are equal to first order because of this condition, which makes sure that you get convergence to something, to, to a diffusion. And now let's see. So this is what the generator or the jump intensities look like in the interior. On the boundary, uh, there are two differences exactly. One is that you cannot jump outside, of course. So this arrow is canceled. The other one is that 
the arrow going down is uh, strengthened. The, the intensity is larger by new, I call it new N2. And the same thing happens on the other bound, on the other face. And at the origin, you're just left with uh, the lambdas. And I'm going to call this process Xn. I'm also going to denote by Zn the unconstrained process that has just this description. It, it takes values in R2 and its jump intensities are exactly like this everywhere in the plane. And we're also assuming that the initial conditions converge. Are there any questions about the model? Okay. Okay, what does it have to do with reflection? Well, the way I described before the reflection in the discrete uh, setting was by projection. Here we don't have projection. What do we have? Instead, we have a mechanism that gives you that instead of that. Let's see the difference. Well, this is canceled. Jumps outside are canceled. And instead, you're adding, you're strengthening these jumps. So the difference is what matters. And the difference on average is reflection in, uh, in it's stochastic, but it's, it, it's on average has oblique direction. And it's a fact that if you had just, just the half plane, it converges to reflected Brownian motion with this deterministic direction of constraint. This is a very standard result. Now you can compute uh, the drift and you can compute the diffusion coefficient. They look like this. And you can further compute the direction of constraint. Uh, and I'm going to assume in this talk for simplicity that the sigmas are equal to one. Now the condition alpha between one and two that I uh, am interested in is equivalent in terms of the problem data to mu one, mu two greater than mu one, mu two. So this is the assumption. And now at last, let's give a precise definition of uh, the Varadan Williams sub martigan problem in S. Here is the precise definition. A solution to the problem, sub martigan problem starting from a point X in the quarter plane is a probability measure P sub X on continuous paths in the quarter plane, satisfying with X being the canonical process, the initial condition, of course, you start at x probability one. The sub martingale property, so this is our uh, elliptic uh, operator, the same object precisely as before is a px sub martingale for any test function that satisfies now also the condition that near the origin is constant, and then it has the correct directional derivatives on the faces. Uh, this is bounded. Uh, so th they have to be bound. F is bounded. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't write it. Yeah. Bound, bound. Yeah. Uh, and the third condition is the corner property, namely that the Lebesgue measure of the set of times when it's at the corner is zero almost surely. And so Vardan Williams and then uh, with Drift, Lackner, New and Reed very recently have proved that there exists a unique solution to the problem, sub martingale problem for general oxi, it's when alpha is less than two, but we're looking at the quarter plane, it always holds. And here is our main result, convergence of Xn to X holds in D, in the D space, and here, what is X is exactly what you expect. It's the RBM defined in terms of the sub martingale problem with this data. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, let me apply it to two queuing models. First, generalized process or sharing, a model uh, introduced by Parek and Gallagher. Uh, where a server divides its effort among jobs, job streams according to fixed proportions. So phi one, phi two are two proportions summing to one. And there are arrival rates, lambda and i, and service rates, mu and i, they are given. And when jobs from both classes are present, the server efforts is split 
and it's split according to these proportions. So the actual service rate is not really mu i, it's phi i times mu i n. When both streams, where drops from both streams are available in the queue. But when one of the queues is empty, there are all the, all the effort of the, of the server is given to the class that is there. So therefore then the service rate is mu n i. And this is a critical load condition. Lambda i equals phi i times mu i now. And you can compute the directions of constraints that are given by that. And they, they satisfy this condition, meaning that they point at each other. This corresponds to alpha equal to one. And in alpha equal to one, the extended score hold map is applicable in the sense that it has unique solutions. And if you denote by Xn the normalized Hue length process, diffusively normalized, then it's a theorem by Ramanan, uh, Kavita, and Marty uh, uh, that you have convergence. And you have convergence to exactly what you expect, the uh, RBM with alpha equal to one. It was actually proved much in much greater generality, namely in general dimension and for general service time distributions, not, not more not from a Markovian process. And it's based on a continuous mapping theory, uh, argument where the continuous mapping uh, comes from an extent, the extended score of map. This is not available when alpha is greater than one. Uh, so uh, but so we, we, we study a variation of this model uh, that we call uh, generalized process sharing with parallelization slowdown. Uh, so we acknowledge the fact that job switching overhead slows down the processor. And we posit that a fixed proportion uh, of the processing capacity is lost at times when parallelization actually takes place, namely where jobs of both uh, classes are, are there in the system. And then you have to parallelize, you have to uh, switch from uh, serving one class to another, but this does not occur when there are only jobs from one class uh, in the system, then you don't need, don't have this overhead, and therefore there's no uh, parallelization. Therefore, we consider GPS with proportions that sum up to a number less than one. Uh, and of course, we need to assume this kind of critical load condition. The formula for the directions of constraints is exactly the same as before, but now the Ds do not point at each other, uh, but instead alpha turns out to be greater than one. And as a corollary of the main result, we get that convergence. Another model is the coupled processor model uh, proposed by Fayol and uh, Yasno yeah, yeah, Gorsky. Sorry about that. Uh, where you have two servers working in parallel, each serving a queue. A server facing an empty queue is available to help the other server. So mu i now are going to be the service rate of server i given to class i, to the one that it usually serves. And new i is going to be the service rate of I dash helping I, okay? The service, the rate that is available to give to the other server. And again, there's a critical load condition. You compute the directions of constraint and you get that. And here, uh, new has exactly this meaning. The new one, new two have the meaning of the processing rate of the helping activities. And if you assume that, then as before, you get alpha greater than one. And again, as a corollary from the main result, we get convergence to that. Are there any questions uh, so far before I start the proof? Let me see how much time. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'd like to give an outline of the proof. 
Oh, the proof goes by the uniqueness method, which means that you start by proving tightness and therefore pre-compactness for the processes, the rescale processes. You prove that limits form solutions to the martingale, to, to the sub problem. And then you use the fact that is known by, by now that uniqueness of solutions holds. And therefore the limit must exist and be equal to that unique solution. Okay, first step, tightness. Let me uh, give some notation that's going to be used. The oscillation of a function over an interval is, as usual, the supremum of the, of the absolute difference. And the modulus of continuity is, again, the supremum of the, of the difference, but when you restrict the times to be of distance delta. So now, Fix epsilon, then given delta, consider the intervals uh, i sub k of length delta. You have one over uh, t over delta of them. And consider three cases. There are exactly three kinds of such intervals. First, consider those intervals, those i k's, where the trajectory of the rescale process of the Markov process during the interval does not intersect a ball of radius epsilon about the origin, but intersects both faces. If it intersects both faces, then there has to be a part of it that starts at one face, gets to the other face without touching the faces at all in between. And therefore this, Part of the path is just the path of the unconstrained trajectory or process, which we know is C tight. Because it's C tight, it means uh, you can, by taking, by making delta small, you can, uh, you, you have con the probability that there is, there is even one such interval converges to zero as delta goes to zero, converges to zero as delta goes to zero uniformly in N because the unconstrained trajectory has this property. Uh, a second type of, of, of inter interval is when the trajectory during the interval intersects at most one phase, then the oscillation or during this interval of the constraint trajectory can be controlled by the oscillation of the unconstrained trajectory simply because this is the standard case when you have only one uh, phase. Intersection, interacting with just one uh, phase mean, meaning projection on uh, convergence to a reflective line of motion of just the half space. And the third kind of interval is a trajectory that does intersect, that does get epsilon close to the corner. Um, and then what you can prove, I'm now giving the details, is that the probability that it also intersects the complement of B2 epsilon is small. Again, uniformly in N as uh, delta goes to zero. So as a result, uh, with probability that converges to one as n goes to infinity first and then delta to zero, uh, the modulus is uh, controlled by that of the unconstrained process and therefore you have C tightness of xn. This is about tightness. Second step uh, is aimed toward, this is the beginning step, aiming toward uh, proving the corner property. So, what you do in this step is you construct a sequence of up crossings, down crossings of the absolute value of x, of xn, or the, the, the norm of xn, during a fixed interval zero t. So what are these? These are up crossings from below epsilon to above two epsilon and down crossings from above two epsilon to below epsilon, like in this picture. This is an example of an up crossing. This is an example of, of a, down crossing and what we're interested in is in the durations of these 
down cro up crossings, down crossings. Initially, we're going to assume zero drift so that we can use more tools. And the goal here is to show that the expected cumulative time in all the up crossings during a fixed interval is small in epsilon uniformly in N. Why is that? Because this will give us almost the corner property. This will give us this. And the reason it will give us this is that the set of times during which the process is epsilon close to the origin is a subset of the set of times at which it is in an up cross. And this is up to Fatou's lemma. It will give you that subsequential limits satisfy the corner property. So this is the aim. And how do we do this? We achieve it by showing that the expected duration of a single up crossing scales like epsilon squared at most. And the expected duration of a single down crossing scales at least like epsilon to the alpha. And you remember that alpha is uh, less than two. And therefore, this is negligible with respect to that. And in fact, these are not just inequalities. We need we only need inequalities for the proof, but these are actually the correct scales. And this is one way of understanding. Uh, so so, so the, the argument breaks down when alpha is two or higher because it's no longer true that your up crossings are negligible uh, in terms of the time spent there. It, will, it breaks down when alpha is two or higher, which is a way of seeing why uh, in Verdon Williams, the this is the limiting case or the, the borderline case between exist, existence of brown motion and a brown motion that gets stuck there. It spends a lot of time in down in up crossings. So next, so the first step in this program, which is the third step, is down crossings. So first, an estimate on down crossings of the RBM itself. And there's a lemma in Varden Williams showing that the expected time of a down crossing for the RBM from the limiting process is bounded below by R by epsilon to the alpha. So we're going to use it. We're going to use it in step four to translate to down crossing estimate for the prelimit. But at this point, it looks like a circular argument. We're in the process of proving convergence to this to, to RBM and we're using the fact that the limiting process has this property and we're translating it to the prelimit. It looks circular, but therefore I have to be more precise about what we exactly do. During a cr down crossing, so I'm explaining how, how exactly we do this trans, trans uh, implication. During a trans, down, down crossing, the process is at least epsilon away from the origin, right? In a down crossing, okay? So the now for a fixed epsilon, the number of times that it switches from visiting one phase to another is a tight sequence as a sequence indexed by n, right? Because it, in order to move from one phase to the other, it has to go roughly epsilon at least. And uh, 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 this means that the unconstrained process has to move that far, but it is C-tight. So it cannot do this many times if for a fixed epsilon as n goes to infinity. But then this reduces the problem very simply because it suffices now to show convergence of uh, the restriction of a single down crossing to the duration where it in interacts only with one phase, right? Because you have just uh, a tight number of switchings like that. So that's enough. But that, that is standard because this is convergence on the half space. So this is doable. The next step is estimates on the up crossing duration. So here we can no longer rely on properties of the limiting process because we're really, really now close to the corner. Uh, so instead we seek a test function that is applicable directly for the prelimit one. So, so to understand the test function that we construct here is a simplified situation where 
uh, the data is uh, symmetric. So the, the re reflection directions are given like that, they are symmetric with respect to each other. Uh, and let's start by asking what a Brownian motion in the plane does without any reflection. Starting at a point x, y, the expected time just a Brownian motion exits the unit ball about the origin is given by this function, which you can verify by solving this PDE with the boundary condition zero on uh, the circle, the unit circle, right? It, you can directly check that. Well, if that's true for uh, our for for Brownian motion, it is also true for RBM in the quarter plane, assuming that the directions of reflection are normal, right? Because it, you can just translate the event to an event regarding uh, reflective Brownian motion by, by taking absolute values for each coordinate, you get reflective Brownian motion. It's just exactly the same event. So the same uh, test function must work in the case where, in the case where you have normal reflection, but we have oblique reflection. So the question is whether you can guess a function that may not have exactly uh, the properties that this, this one had, but some something weaker that is sufficient. Let's see. So how can you modify this test function in such a way that the Laplacian of the term that you add is zero? Well, you can add 2a x, y, where a is an arbitrary number, which is a degree of freedom for you. Uh, and you can check, in, instead of having um, equality to zero, it's enough to, to have an inequality like that. And, and to have, the instead of having the function positive all the way to the boundary of the circle, of, of, of the disk, it's enough to have uh, it positive in, 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 in some neighborhood of the origin. So if you weaken that, you find that this indeed works when you select A to be C minus one, C is that. And so this motivates the following test function. We're working at the scale epsilon instead of the scale one. Here's a lemma, denote A to be C minus one in the symmetric case, otherwise it's a slightly more complicated test function. In the symmetric case, this is a good test function in the sense that it is positive in some vicinity of the origin of size epsilon. Its generator, this is the generator of the pre-limit process, is bounded above by minus one for all n. And this is a good test function in the sense that if you apply the fact that this object is a martingale, and you use all these inequalities, it gives you an estimate on the time. Next step, uh, well, the previous step gives estimate, this is, this is a very simple step, it gives an estimate on this expression for the case of zero drift. Uh, for general drift, you use Gilsonov's theorem, and then you get uh, this, bounded by the same expression times a certain constant, which is enough when you take epsilon to zero to get the corner property. And the final step is to prove the submartingale property. And here, an important lemma, uh, I mean, crucial for us to prove the martingale property is, is this, that the time the pre-limit process spends on the faces can be estimated in terms of the time that it spends at the origin. So what do we have? How do we use this lemma? Well, first of all, of course, you want to prove the semi-martingale, uh, oh, sorry, you want to prove the sub martingale property for the weak limits of, of Xn. So you apply, so you write an expression for F of Xn before taking limits. You use Taylor's expansion. And, and then you take limits, but so, so what you observe is that when you write this expression, you get 
a sub martingale, but plus some error terms. And the error terms involve the time at which the process is on the boundary on the two faces and the origin. Now, at the origin, we already know from the previous step that the time spent there goes to zero. And from this lemma, sorry, where is the lemma? From this lemma, we know that this controls the time on both faces and therefore the time on the boundary also goes to zero. And therefore the, um, th this is how you show that the, the, these error terms converge to zero weekly. Uh, I'm about to conclude. So let me give just two concluding remarks. Uh, one, uh, so, so you would like to, to uh, uh, extend, extend these results, at least in this direction, an invariance principle, and this is work in progress. Uh, and the challenge here, I didn't say, but we use strongly the strong Markov property. We, we, use it, we use it in an essential way. Strong Markov property for the pre-limit processes. And you don't have it in situations where you want to apply, uh, wh where the processes are driven by renewal processes, which is what you want to do if you want to apply uh, to queuing. Uh, so, so this is the challenge there. The other thing is much more ambitious. Uh, I already mentioned, well, we don't have anything in that direction, but I just want to mention a conjecture. We already, I already mentioned that in dimension three and higher, the well posedness of RBM is open or the sub martingale problem. But clearly, on the one hand, solutions do not always exist because we know it's from dimension two. On the other hand, the quarter plane in dimension two is a borderline case. And here, in particular, solutions always exist. So it motivates the conjecture that at least for the, in higher dimension, at least for the orthant, whatever you do, uh, you will, as long as the directions point inward, the sub martingale problem would have, uh, will be well posed, but this is, this is open. So I'll finish here. Uh, thank you very much, Rami. Uh, are there any questions from the audience, first of all? Chris, and then... I think you have to use it. Okay, so my, my question is um, mot motivated or inspired by computer simulations. So say we are on a grid, right? A standard lattice, and we want to simulate this process. Um, so I assume that if we are just close to one of the boundaries, but away from the corner, then this would be pretty standard. The question is, if you want to simulate the process, is there any anything special that you have to do close to the corner or at the corner, or is this straightforward? I don't know. I, I have mine. Uh, I don't know uh, the exact answer to that, but the way I uh, presented the problem was that uh, you just uh, don't care about what happens in the corner. I, I mean, I mean, it's a conjecture, of course. You don't care about what happens in the corner as long as you don't go very far and you stay diffusive, but you do something random. So uh, my guess would be that if you're close to the corner microscopically, uh, then just use some random direction that lands you inside. But this is a simplifying assumption, but I think you're asking something more difficult that I don't know. No, I, I was just asking if there is an obvious and simple way to simulate the process. And I'm not asking for an optimal way or just just basically a simple way to simulate it. Well, the processes that we studied are very, very, a very simple description. Yeah, th these are very simple. Uh, just, well, I mean, I mentioned two. You can also just jump out from the corner and it doesn't actually matter what direction you jump out from. You just let the jump shrink to zero. Uh, what happens if you spoil transition 
intensities in one point. If so you change? Yeah, if you change. Yeah, Transition. just multiply by two, for example. At one point? At one point, yes. How sensitive is your result? So, uh, in you can ask the same question about just uh, unconstrained random walk, and it will still converge. Yes. You mean on the boundary? The probability of getting there is too small, so it will not affect. Sure, uh, it will get there. My guess, my guess is that it will not matter. It will not change, but uh, I can't tell you precisely. Th this is my understanding. I'm not sure. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, wait, 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 wait. The existence of invariant or equilibrium probability measure for the reflected brown image. Uh, this is an excellent question for Ruth, I think. Can you repeat the question, please? Invariant. What is known currently about uh, existence of the invariant probability distribution and convergence to it for the uh, reflected down in motion? You should try and answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know the generality in which it holds, yeah. Or, well, if you have no drift, there's a an invariant distribution, right? It's... You're asking about convergence or the forms? Well, you need to have some. You need to have some kind of uh, positive recurrent. Yeah, yeah, sure. If that that's the question, you need to have. So, so there are uh, works on uh, the conditions for the geometry of the problem, such as the how the drift uh, is related to the directions of constraints, which give you uh, sufficient conditions for positive recurrence, and then things should work. And when they do not, do not, uh, the, when they're not satisfied and you have transients, you don't expect that, of course. There, there are explicit uh, conditions for that. In two dimensions, right? In, in two dimensions, also when the score hold problem is, uh, is well posed, the additional conditions, so cone conditions. For, for the problem in the corner, is it in terms of alpha? Well, without drift, it's in terms of alpha, yes. In fact, there's this harmonic function that has a pole of order alpha at the origin for hitting the origin, and the invariant measure has a power of minus alpha. It's radius to the minus alpha times an of a function of the angle. Uh, I think those are only sufficient conditions, right? There's in two dimensions is necessary and sufficient. Okay. All right. Maybe there's some other work of Mari Bramson in higher dimensions. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, um. If if we give up oblique reflection, but we have normal reflection, then uh, uh, there is a result in very great generality. Norm normal, normally reflected uh, process, say with a constant drift. Uh, so Brownian motion with a constant drift uh, has an exponential uh, invariant measure in in higher dimensions, basically in any set. No no assumptions on smoothness of the boundary. 